Hello and welcome to this afternoon session about tips and tricks for writing a good proposal. Of course, we all want to know the magic trick for being su successful. This we, we cannot provide, but we will try to explain to you what you should take into account when you prepare your proposal for a call under Horizon Europe. Uh, my name is Peter Hertwig. I am a head of unit in the European Commission's Directorate General for Research and Innovation. Uh, my unit deals with the business processes for implementing the Horizon programs. I am here today with my colleagues Alberto Fraile Ramos and Isabel Fergara, who will start giving you some short presentations. And we are also particularly happy to have a colleague from the Czech National Contact Point, Ms. Lenka Hwekova, who will give uh, also a short presentation then on the point of view of National Contact Points in guiding uh, potential applicants to preparing a good proposal. Uh, before we go into the subjects, one more housekeeping uh, remark. We will have at the end a questions and answers session. This will happen in Slido. You will afterwards see the credentials in order to access Slido. I would ask you to go there immediately and as soon as you have a question, put it in. You should, uh, but you should also look at questions that might already be there and upvote questions that you would have asked yourself too. So, so instead of repeating the same or a similar question, just click on the thumbs up on that particular question. And we will, at the end, go through the questions in the order of number of likes. Before we go into the first presentations, we have prepared two very simple polls, basically to see who is here behind the screen with us and to get a first impression. So if I can ask the yes, please. So please, if you can also all go to slido.com and then the uh, code for today is RI22 workshops. And then we have already the first question up. Where are you? What is your function? Where are I on what subject related to Horizon Europe are you working? Are you more an administrator or more a scientist, engineer or expert? Or eventually a national contact point or other support person. We see that the replies come in. I wait for a few more seconds to give you the possibility to reply. Maybe a remark to our session organizers. I see we have people waiting in the lobby. Okay, I think the figure stabilized. So a slight majority apparently is working in administrative functions, but we also have a quite high participation from people actually implementing the project. Thank you very much for this. So we have an impression to who we talk. And we would go immediately into our second question for this poll. Should come up very soon. There it is. So what is your level of appreciation of the proposal submission system of the funding and tenders portal? Of course, this question is uh, for you only if you have experience with it already. Okay, I see also here the figure stabilize. So we have about a quarter of participants that are newcomers. We have half of our audience mildly satisfied and a few, one fifth very satisfied. Only four dissatisfied. This is of course, in a certain sense, somehow mildly reassuring for us to formulate it like this. Thanks a lot. 
for this first impression, uh, I see we have about 230 participants today at the moment. And without further ado, I would say we go into the first presentation. So I would hand over to my colleague Alberto Freile. Alberto, please. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon to all. Thank you, Peter, and good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I will share with you some tips and tricks on how to write your proposal in Horizon Europe, and in particular under the section one that covers the excellent criterion. Isabel, my colleague, later on will cover the sections that are related to the other two evaluation criteria, impact and quality of the implementation. And let's start with some key principles that you need to keep in mind at the time that you start preparing your proposal. These are principles that are related to different evaluation criteria and to the different parts of the proposal. As you know, Horizon Europe proposal templates include some changes in comparison with the templates in Horizon 2020. And the most important one is that we have added instructions on the information that you need to include in the proposal. So the proposal template is longer. It includes more text now for you to read, but this doesn't mean that you need to include more information in comparison with Horizon 2020. What we have done is improving the instructions for you. There are some key principles that you need to take into account to write the proposal in Horizon Europe. The first one, and this is particularly important for Pillar 2, is that you are sending your proposal to a topic which seems, in most of the cases, very prescriptive. So you need to take care that your proposed work is within the scope of the topic to which you are submitting your proposal. As I said, this is very important with Pillar 2 and is not so crucial in those bottom-up calls in which we have topics, not prescriptives, but rather open for ideas. Then, and this is related mainly to the excellent criteria, you need to demonstrate that your idea is ambitious and goes beyond the state of the art. And for this, you will find instructions in the proposal on how to demonstrate it. We will also assess the scientific methodology. And you must consider for most of the topics in Horizon Europe that your work is interdisciplinary, that you take into account the gender dimension in research and innovation content, and that you also consider open sciences practices when you design your scientific methodology. Then, in particular for criterion impact, you should show in your project how you will contribute to the outcomes and impacts described in the topic descriptions that you are answering to. This is what we call in Horizon Europe, the pathway to impact. And for this, Isabel will come with more information later on. We will also assess the measures that you propose to maximize the impact of your proposal, what we call the plan for dissemination and exploitation, including communication activities. And finally, and this is related to the third evaluation criteria, you should demonstrate the quality of your work plan, the resources and the quality of the participants. So, these are the key principles that you always need to take into account. In addition, most of our calls, we also consider policy aspects or horizontal aspects that you must take into account as part of one or more of the evaluation criteria. You need to be aware that in Horizon Europe, we apply open science across the program. So, this is something that you will need to pay a lot of attention when writing your proposal. The gender dimension in research and innovation content is applicable in all topics in Horizon Europe, 
unless is mentioning in the topic description that is not relevant. If you don't find a sentence in the topic description that the gender dimension in research and innovation content is not relevant, this means that you have to take it into account. We have one novelty in Horizon Europe. As I say, what we call the pathway to impact. The measures to maximize impact, and then we also pay attention to artificial intelligence. So, if you are using artificial intelligence in your work, and I'm not talking about developing or making research on artificial intelligence, but to the use of artificial intelligence as part of your methodology, you will have to demonstrate the robustness of the technology that you are using. And then, in specific topics, you may also find that other aspects are important, like, for instance, the inclusions of social science and humanities. Next slide, please. As for the excellent criterion, and I will be very brief, we will ask our experts to assess the project's objectives and the scientific methodology. These are the two main aspects that the experts will assess in the excellent criterion. When we brief the experts on how to assess the project objectives, we are asking them to answer for every proposal whether the proposal includes clear and pertinent objectives to the topic, whether the objectives are measurable and verifiable, whether the objectives are realistically achievable. They also need to assess whether the proposed work is ambitious and goes beyond the state of the art, whether it includes groundbreaking research and innovation, if it includes novel concepts and approaches, and if it will develop new products, services, or business and organization models. And then we will also ask the experts to assess whether the research and innovation maturity is in line with the different types of actions of the topic description. And as for the scientific methodology, we are asking the experts to assess whether the scientific methodology includes the concepts, model, and assumptions that underpin the work, and whether these are clear and sound. We will also ask the experts whether it's clear how expertise and methods from different disciplines will be brought together and integrated in pursuit of the objectives. That means that in most of our topics, we are looking for interdisciplinary approaches. If you think that an interdisciplinary approach is not needed for your project, you need to justify why. And then we will ask our experts whether your justification is credible. We will also ask whether the gender dimension in research and innovation content has been properly taken into account whether open science practices are implemented as an integral part of the proposed scientific methodology, whether the research data management is properly addressed, and if the topic includes other aspects such as the integration of social science and humanities, whether the integration of these disciplines is properly addressed. And with this, I finish my slides. Thank you, Peter, very much. And I pass the floor to Isabel. Thank you, Alberto. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, I will continue the presentation with uh, some tips and, and tricks uh, on how to write uh, your proposal in the sections on impact and quality of the implementation. So, as you know, we have three main sessions in the proposal, excellence, impact, and quality of the implementations, which mirror the three evaluation criteria that we have in, in Horizon uh, Europe. Um, 
Before going to, to this information about impact, uh, I would like to stress that the information we are given is particular, particularly relevant for uh, Pillar 2, as Alberto already mentioned, and also uh, relevant for research and innovation actions and innovation actions. Yeah. Other type of actions may have a slightly different evaluation criteria may also have a slightly different um, instructions in the proposal template, but as uh, you will uh, see later on, the instructions that we are giving now are very much mirroring the instructions that we include in the proposal template. So you can go to the proposal template of, of that specific type of action and, and, and extract fr from them the, the tips uh, to write the proposal. So going to the section two, the impact. So how to write up a good section on impact uh, for uh, that allow to uh, our evaluators to evaluate your proposal very well on on the impact evaluation criterion. I would like first to explain a little bit uh, what is the impact uh, logic that we use in Horizon Europe. I will not spend a lot of time here, but I think it's important for you to understand how we draft our work programs. So, so when drafting our work programs, we start with uh, certainly a couple of years in advance before publications. And we, our starting point is the EU policy priorities, like for instance, the Green Deal, fit for, for digital aids, um, etc. Uh, within this priority, the second steps is the, to define uh, the um, uh, the objectives in which we believe that uh, investment in research will make a difference for society, or for society, for the economy, or for the science uh, in general. So, uh, for instance, in, in these first years of uh, Horizon Europe, we have identified four objectives in which uh, we believe that um, investment in research will make a difference for all us. Then within these uh, four areas that we have identified at the beginning of Horizon Europe, we define impact areas where uh, we believe that indeed the, the funding in the investment in, in the research will have a long term effect in our society, in our economy or in our science. And then within these impact areas, we go more into detail and defined what will be these long-term uh, effects that we want to obtain by funding our projects, by funding our research. And then this uh, uh, long-term in, uh, effects, this um, expected impacts uh, are translated into the work program and grouped in destinations. So these long-term uh, effects will be in our work program uh, as destinations. And within these destinations, we have a number of calls and the results, the effects of the projects that we find in all these calls will contribute to this expected impact uh, that we um, that we defined uh, for long term effect. And for each of the calls, these calls that contribute to the destinations, to the long term effects, we also defined medium term effects, and this will be the effects that every single project uh, funded under each of these topics will contribute to. And all together, the effects of all these projects together will contribute in a longer term to the impact that we define in the destinations. So this is our logic. But uh, this is not the logic that you should follow when drafting your proposal. So for you, of course, you start with an area. So you are making research in an area. You look into uh, the topic in which you believe uh, you uh, want to make a difference. And then um, you read the expected outcome and the expected impact that we uh, define in, in the work program. And with the expected results that you plan to obtain with your project, so the starting point for you will be your expected results, then you will have to explain us in your proposal what will be the contribution to the expected outcomes as defined in each of the topics 
these small calls, and these are medium term effects, and what will be the contribution of your work to longer term effects, and these are the expected impacts that are defined in the destinations. So this is more or less the impact logic that we follow, and, and I think this is what we expect you to, to follow as well, so the methodology to define your impact. And on the evaluation on the impact of your proposal, so we will uh, see into two um, main aspects. So first, we will ask our experts to, to assess the, um, the credibility of the pathway to impact, the pathway to impact that you described in your proposal. And then we will also ask our experts to evaluate or to assess the quality of the measures that you propose to maximize this impact. So on the first aspect, so uh, on the credibility of the proposed pathway to impact that you include in your proposal. So the first thing is um, we will ask our experts whether the contribution of the projects towards the expected outcome of the topic, a medium term effect, and to the wider impacts in, in, in a longer term, as described in the destination, whether this is credible in your proposal. So you have to present a credible pathway to impact. We will also ask you to describe in, in your proposal what are the potential barriers to the expected outcomes and impacts. So meaning, for instance, imagine that um, we, there are other um, funding agencies that are funding research in the same area, they are more advanced, so maybe your research will come a little bit uh, later and it will not be possible or so easy to, to exploit. So, so for instance, this is one of the possible barriers you, that you may encounter in the work that you plan to do. You can also encounter barriers to, to the effects that you want to produce in the regula regulatory environment. For instance, you also need to look into the targeted markets, uh, user behavior, etc. This will depend, of course, on the work that you are proposing. You need to identify these uh, potential barriers and you also need to, to tell us what are the mitigation measures that you propose to overcome these, these barriers. And also, you will need to tell us whether you think that um, there is any potential negative environmental outcome or impact, including when the results of your, of your project are brought at scale, so after the end of the project. So you should identify those, and if indeed um, there are um, potential negative um, uh, a risk to the environment, you have to tell us how are you going to manage this. So you have to manage this, you have to have a plan to manage this uh, properly. And finally, we are also asking you to include the scale and significance of the project's contribution to the expected outcomes and impacts. So by scales, um, we refer to how widespread the outcomes and impacts are likely to be. For example, in terms of the size of the target group that will benefit from the results of your project. And um, by significance, we refer to the importance of, uh, uh, of the benefits that, um, that you are producing uh, or expected to produce by, uh, with the results of, of your project. So then we go to the second aspect that we will evaluate in, in the impact criterion and is the, um, the quality of the measures to maximize the impact. So the dissemination, exploitation and communication activities. So as you know, in all proposals, you need to include a first version of the plan for dissemination and exploitation, including communication activities. This is an eligibility criteria. So, sorry, admissibility criteria. So, you have to include this information there in the proposal. We will ask uh, our experts whether this plan is, is suitable for the project activities and if it is of a good quality. And then, of course, uh, there is not a unique plan that is valid for all type of projects. You need to take into account that the, the, the measures that you are proposing should be proportionate to the scale of the project and should include concrete actions to be implemented both during the life of the project and also after the end of the project. 
you need to identify uh, what will be the target groups that will benefit from the results of the projects, if it is the scientific community, if it is the uh, end users, financial actors, public, uh, etc. And you also need to include uh, a strategy for, for the management of intellectual property. Um, if you do not plan to exploit your results, you also need to tell us why is this, yeah, so why you do not plan to exploit your results. And if you plan, of course, to, uh, to exploit the results, you need to include this plan. If the exploitation is expected primarily, primarily in non-associated third countries, then uh, you need also to explain and justify how the funding of this work will be uh, in the Union's uh, interest. So this is so far for the impact criteria, and here um, I wanted to to describe an example um, on how you should uh, describe the pathway to impact in your proposal. But probably you are very tired, or some of you are very tired of this example because this is the example that we presented in several webinars. It is also the example that we include in the proposal template. So I keep this example in the slides, but I am going to present another one. This one, which is coming from um, area in cluster two, so it's a, a topic in which many of you have told us uh, or it's very difficult to quantify the impact. So let's try with this example. It's uh, coming from a real topic in cluster two in World Program 2022 or 2021, I don't remember. Um, and then uh, this is a proposal that was submitted to a topic where the expected outcome, so medium term effect, is to show evidence of the role of the cultural and creative, creative industries as drivers of innovation in other economic sectors such as industry and services. This is the expected outcome as described in the topic condition. And then, in addition, this topic was included in a destination where the expected impact or one of the expected impacts, longer term effects, was to demonstrate the full potential of cultural heritage, arts and cultural and creative sectors as a driver of sustainable innovation. So, first, you have this topic, you want to make some research and you want to demonstrate that the results of your project will have an effect or will contribute to this expected outcome and this expected impact. So you send a proposal, um, you explain how you are going to work, and you also present in the proposal what, that, what are the expected results that you want to obtain in the project. For instance, in this particular project, uh, you expect to uh, identify for creative collaborative geographical areas, where the developing of cross-sectoral cultural and creative industry networks can have an impact on other industry, uh, focus on tourism or gaming. So you expect to explain that this is the result that you are expected to obtain, and then you also explain what will what will be the dissemination and exploitation activities. So the activities that you will do to maximize the impact of your results. And after this dissemination and exploitation activities, you also expect that the industry networks sust are sustained in the four locations beyond the time of the project and are adopted in at least three other locations. Yeah, this is medium term effect. And then the contribution of these project results into expected impact, longer term results will be Models of cooperation with cultural and creative industries become common for the development of sustainable innovations in other sections. We know that in certain areas, and in particular in cluster two, it is very difficult to quantify. In this particular topic, uh, we could still quantify some of the expected outcomes. And uh, for this reason, we are including also an additional example. You will have it here in the slides but I will not go into the details. And this is um, another example for cluster two and in a topic um, dealing with democracy. So you can have these, these examples um, in, in the slides. 
So, and then I continue with the third section in the proposal, which is linked to the third evaluation criterion, the quality of the implementation. And here we will ask our experts to assess two uh, aspects. First is the quality of the work plan. And the second aspect is the quality of the consortium and the participants. Yeah. So on the first aspect, on the quality of the work plan, so is uh, in, in this section, you will present the work plan. So the timing of the deliverables, what will be the, the, the main milestones, if there are decision points during the project in which you have to decide a way to go within several possibilities, etc. This is a, this is an example of the work plan. So this you define in, in your proposal. And then we will ask our experts whether the work plan that you propose is of good quality and if will be effective. It has also to include quantified information so, so we can progress the so we can um, monitor the progress of the project. It has to follow a logic structure, in particular regarding the timing of the work packages. And um, um, that you have to have a, a right resources allocated to the work packages and also uh, resources overall allocated to the to the whole project. And of course, you can also need to include uh, in the proposal whether you uh, already identify critical risk um, related to the implementation of the project and also uh, the measures that you are proposing to mitigate those uh, risks. And then um, for the second aspect, so for the quality of the participants and the consortium as a whole, uh, we will ask uh, our experts uh, whether the consortium matched the project's objectives and bring together the necessary, the necessary disciplines and interdisciplinary knowledge needed for, for the proposed work uh, that you include in your proposal. Whether the consortium includes expertise in open science practices, this is something that it has to be included in, in all proposal, is an horizontal aspect that must be included in, in as a scientific in the scientific methodology of the of the project. Also expertise in, in gender aspects um, and um, as appropriate. So o, o, not if the topic is black as not relevant for, for gender uh, dimension. If the topic is flag uh, as relevant for social science and humanities, we will also ask our experts whether the consortium, consortium include expertise in, in this discipline. Uh, we will also look, uh, or the experts will also look uh, uh, whether the partners have access to critical inf infrastructure if this is needed. And um, we will also ask uh, whether the participants are complementing uh, one another. So to cover the value chains uh, where appropriate and to cover all activities in the project. And, um, and we don't see that uh, there are um, too many overlaps between um, the, the participants. And uh, we will also see in which way each of the participants contribute to the project, uh, whether they all have a valid role, uh, whether they all have adequate resources allocated to them, um, and also whether they really have the capacity to do what they are supposed to do in the project. And then, um, if, if relevant, we will also check whether um, there is involvement of industrial or commercial um, organizations in the project to ensure exploitation of, of the results. And um, I think I finished my present. Well, yes, I want to finish here with more information. So, so for you, when you are preparing a proposal, will be also very useful to know how we we will brief the experts. So, on the standard briefing for for experts is something that we publish in the portal. You have the link here. But we have also published very recently some videos for experts, but these are published for everybody um, to help them to evaluate a specific policy aspects in Horizon Europe proposals, like uh, gender dimension, like uh, um, open science, op uh, and also dissemination and exploitation, etc. And if you want to know more about how is the evaluation process, how is the submission process in, in Horizon Europe, 
I think it's a good idea to participate as an expert in, in our evaluations. So as you know, all our proposals are evaluated by external experts and we have a goal for um, expression of interest uh, continuously open in the portal so you can register in this link that you see in this slide and then um, you are included in the database and when we organize our evaluations we go to this database to look for the expertise that we need uh, for the evaluation of our proposals. It will be very helpful for you to understand how uh, this evaluation process is organized uh, internally. With this I finish the presentation and I pass uh, the floor to Lenka. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you and share my experience. I work as a legal and financial national contact point, so called uh, NCP at the Technology Center of the Czech Academy of Science. I have been working in that uh, NCP business already for many, many years, so I dare to be here and share my experience. Who are actually NCPs? NCPs are national contact points that provide information and on-ground services to you, to applicants and beneficiaries in your own countries and in your own language. If you would like to find out who is an NCP in your country, use the database on the Funding and Tender Opportunities Portal. You can find there uh, all your NCPs in your country, uh, legal and financial NCPs or all thematic NCPs that cover all the thematic areas of Horizon Europe. NCPs are really often also experts in a uh, different experts group of the European Commission and in relevant uh, program committees. So they should have the broad knowledge about the program. How can NCPs help you? What services do they provide? First, they can find to help you the relevant topics. Uh, Isabella talk about the Horizon Europe impact logic. So NCPs are the right person who really understand it, who know what are the European policies and the strategic documents that are relevant to uh, the calls and topics that you could be interested in. So don't hesitate to use this knowledge of the European politics and policies and all strategic documents. Further, the NCPs can help you find the consortia uh, of course, our experience is that the best partners are uh, the partners that you already know uh, or partners that you meet on the conferences or that you already have contacts with through Marie Skolovska Curie events or from your past European projects. But there are also different networks uh, and uh, different platforms and NCPs can help you to find the relevant platforms and networks for you. There is also a CORDIS database. It's a database of already financed European projects and NCPs. They know what is inside this CORDIS database and they uh, can help you to find the relevant projects uh, for you, for your relevant calls uh, and relevant topics. And also uh, NCPs and their networks organize brokerage events, these networking events where you could register and use to find partners for your projects. And last, not least, there are many partner search tools and NCPs can help you to orientate in, uh, in these all tools. Also, when you write the proposal, NCPs can give you a tailor-made assistance. They know all the documents, guidelines, for manuals. There are actually many of them, many of them, and all of them actually are on the funding and tender portal but NCPs know which are relevant in which part and can help you what to read at which time. Our proposal is when there is a call open for the proposal, read uh, the text and documents already in the call, relevant for the call, because there could be some specialties concerning the page limit countries, etc. So just use all the documents that are relevant for your already open call. When you write the proposal, NCPs can help you and give you advice on administrative procedures and contractual issues. Uh, there is also a legal uh, NCP who can talk about you about no non-fidentiality uh, disclosures, etc. So 
don't hesitate to contact them. When you have your proposal almost finished, uh, NCPs in different areas, in different NCP projects, and in different countries offer to you so-called pre-proposal checks. Uh, there are full proposal check events organized by NCP networks. Also in a couple countries, for example, in the Czech Republic as well, we offer to coordinators possibility uh, to find an experienced evaluator who can uh, unofficially, informally do the uh, reading of the proposal and say the opinion. This is also in other countries. So use these uh, professional experts uh, to pre-evaluate your proposals. NCPs know how the funding and tender opportunities portal work, which is really useful. Uh, at the research that Peter did on the start, there are many uh, of you here who are the newcomers who have never used this funding and tender opportunities portal before. So it can be really hand for, uh, handy for you that there are people and colleagues who can help you to put the proposal in the portal. Just for you to know, there is also really practical green uh, how to button uh, in the portal. Their commission prepares print screens and useful information about working from uh, from the start of the project till the end, uh, while the whole life cycle of the project, uh, how to work in the portal. So it's very useful, very handy. And uh, NCPs organize many events. Uh, they have their websites, they have their national websites, and also website of an NCP portal, general one, and they have different newsletters, so be in touch with them. And what are the tips and tricks that I managed to collect with my colleagues? At the start, I'd like to say to you that, according to our experience, in general, each evaluator spans from two to four hours reading your proposal. So you see it's uh, it's pretty short time and you have to be aware of that. So the important message is that you have to attract the attention of uh, the evaluator. So you have to have exciting first pages, good abstract and clear and convincing objectives. Good abstract is really essential. We have feedback from coordinators that already after reading the abstract, they know probably which projects they will like and will be higher scored and which one probably are not so good and not so interesting to them. So it's really important. Also, evaluators don't like when there is so much talking before you get to the point. So really, you have to have clear and convincing objectives that have to go to the point not so much talking before you get to the point. The proposal has to be well structured. It seems clear, but still, uh, there are good instructions from the Commission. There is a template guidelines really follow these instructions. Evaluators really expect that they'll read the information when they expect them on the spot that this information should be. Really often we see that uh, clients are saying we had the information in the proposal but it was probably on a different spot that the evaluators expected. So really bear in mind that evaluators spend just a couple hours on the projects by reading your projects. So they have to find the information on the spot where they would expect the information. Just be clear enough, not generic. There are page limits. Now the page limits are uh, really strict, I would say, and uh, you have no space to use extra words, I would say. Be consistent. Uh, all the information that you put in the work package description should reflect the information that are in the gun chart and in all the other parts of uh, your proposal. Sometimes there are mistakes and it's not good, uh, good when the evaluators see that you are not consistent in the proposal. Be sufficiently challenging, uh, use specific and measurable indicators, and be reasonable concerning the number of deliverables. Now we see the tendency for uh, not so many deliverables. In the past, we could see uh, tens or even sometimes hundreds uh, deliverables. It's not the situation anymore. 
uh, try to be so condensed and really not have so many deliverables. Just to give you a hint, even though each project is really specific and there are no limits from the commission, just to have you an idea, uh, VC projects with, let's say, seven work packages and each of them one to four deliverables. It could be so different in different projects, but this is just for you to have an idea. There is necessary to have balance between partners, countries, academia and industry, and between budget of the partners and work packages. Already Isabel talked about it, so I just would like to remind uh, each partner needs to have role in the project. It does not necessarily mean that each partner has to have the same number of person months, but it has to be clear that all of them are important and do some work. Uh, concerning the countries, also be aware that uh, these are European projects. Uh, there needs to be European added value, uh, and it's not national. It's not a uh, national funding agency, so it's not good when there are too many partners from one country. Or, for example, if you have environmental, let's have an example of environmental projects. Uh, there are, of course, different conditions in countries on the south and on the north. So you have to cover all of them, ideally, in your project. Uh, also concerning the budget, uh, be aware that it's not that all of you partners have to have the same budget, but it's not good when one partner has the majority of the budget and the rest is just there because they are just there. It's European project. So it has to be somehow balanced. On the other side, of course, uh, there are different salary levels in each country. So don't try to uh, put the same salary level for all the partners. Just uh, be realistic. There are different salary levels in each countries. Concerning the appropriate resources, just again to give you some hints, um, many of you, the clients are asking, what should be the limit or is there a limit for the work package for management? So there are no limits. Uh, set by the Commission by the rules. What we often see is about 10% of the budget. Again, it's so subjective, but just to give you some hint where maybe you could be around. Again, work package uh, dissemination, exploitation, communication. Isabella talked how important it is. We see that really uh, it's forgotten by beneficiaries how important this work package is. So don't forget it. And again, the idea what we see about is like 15% of the budget plus minus. Uh, of course, in this part, it really depends on the area and what is uh, the objective of the call and the project. But just to give you some hints, uh, you can be around these numbers and percentages. Use of experts. Don't afraid using uh, advisory boards. That's what we see that could be advisable. And last but not least, uh, high quality graphics. Really, a picture is worth a thousand words. Don't forget it. It's so important. Uh, and you can make your project more attractive just because you also use graphics. It's really handy. What already uh, Isabel said, and I would like to really confirm her words, use uh, the possibility to be the evaluator. Register. Uh, in the commission database. If you would like to write a good proposal, it's great to see how good proposals look like when you really evaluate them. And it's also good to see how bad proposals look like. So that's really great experience. Don't hesitate to look uh, at the web pages of the commission funding and tender opportunities portal at the web pages of uh, the NCP project and start early enough. Really often you ask when to start, and my advice is what we see when you start three months before the deadline, according to our experience, is too late, really too late. And don't forget to contact your NCPs. We are here really for you for free and in your countries. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much to all the speakers. We go immediately into the questions and answers. We have unfortunately only a few minutes left.
So if I can ask the colleagues to bring up the Slido questions in the order of number of likes, and we go immediately into the first one. Which are the most common drawbacks found by the evaluators for each section? Isabel, can you try a short answer? I will try, but this is a very difficult question to, to answer. Yeah, so I think on excellent probably uh, the drawback uh, or the prayers are more criticized because they are not beyond the state of the art. They are not uh, really uh, innovative. Uh, I, I think this is my experience. Eh? On impact is probably the quality of, of uh, or the credibility of the impact of the pathway to impact. Uh, so the experts think that it's not credible, and on the quality of the implementation, um, yeah, here I cannot say we have a variety of, of uh, drawbacks. Uh, yeah, it could be that the consortium is not well balanced, uh, the resources are not uh, correctly allocated. Etc. No, I cannot get one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Next one. Is there a possibility to have access to project proposals for previous one projects? I will quickly answer myself. In principle, no, because all proposals, including the successful ones, have to be treated confidentially. But we, of course, publish information on all successful projects that are actually funded. And we have possibilities in the portal to to contact these successful projects. So if you want to do this, try to contact a few projects in your area and see whether they will share with you their original proposals. Next one, will the slides be available? Simple reply, yes, not only the slides, but also the recording of the whole session. Next one, could you state, oh, sorry. No, the next one is now, will there be a new version of the EC template specifically for call topics funded under lump sums? And I think Adarto has to reply. Thank you, Peter. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Yes, for lump sums, uh, no, we use the standard part B template. And as you know, there is an additional annex, an Excel for the detailed budget table. Okay, next one. Could you state how evaluators are advised to address interdisciplinary aspects that aspect doesn't appear in the evaluator guidance presentation? Isabel, would you? Yes, so um, I think this is indeed something that is probably is not very clear to, to the participants, but this is in most of the cases, in, if not in all the cases, embedded in the topic description. So, so when there is a need of the interdisciplinarity, uh, and this is in the, the case in most of, of our calls in, in Pillar 2, this is already embedded in the scope of the topic. So you just need to answer the topic, to read very well the topic. The experts will do the same, and then they will evaluate accordingly. Yeah. Next one. Could you explain the difference between the description of communication and the dissemination activities and how it should be reflected in the application? Alberto, I think you can reply. Okay. Um, yes, communication is um, to promote your actions and results, while dissemination is how you make your results public. Communication, for example, is reaching, uh, reaching uh, multiple audiences like citizens, the media, stakeholders. And how you should reflect this in the proposal? Well, you have to have a well-designed strategy. You need to pass on clear messages. You need to use the right media channels. And dissemination is uh, also about open science. Uh, is uh, knowledge and research that are free of charge. And this is not only for other scientists, but also for other uh, that can learn from your results, for example, authorities, policymakers, civil society. And how do you reflect this? Well, uh, you explain how you are going to publish your results. It can be scientific magazines. It can be uh, scientific or target uh, conferences, also databases. But uh, I will advise uh, you to consult the Horizon Europe program guide. 
there you will find a full section on communication dissemination and exploitation explaining how to address this in the proposals thank you and the next one in the part b template guidance guidance can you please add more varied and discipline based examples of scale and significance indicators as well as in the section two three table and we isabel yes so so for us it's very costly to publish new version of the template in the portal so we use this event to show different examples as we did today so so we in the next uh, publication of, of a new version we will try to change the example we we include there but but we use these uh, webinars and, and this event and workshops to, to show more examples. Okay, we are already reaching the end of this session. I suggest we go still through the next two questions and then I'm afraid we have to stop. So next one, what is the reason behind removing the PMs and deliverables in the work program tables? Isabel again? Yes, but this is what this was already the case in Horizon 2020. We didn't ask a person months per deliverable, and we have kept the same. So we ask person months per work package, not per deliverable. Yeah. Okay, and the last one: which number do you consider as a good number for the number of deliverables? Maybe this is a question for Lenka because you started speaking about this. Yeah, it, it's difficult to say. Uh, as I said, uh, in the past, we saw a huge amount of numbers of deliverables. And now we see it's really like two to four per work package. Uh, there is online guide where there was written 15 uh, for the whole project, but it was explained that it's not explicitly meant for Horizon Europe, that there is expected could be more. But it's kind of hint for you to see that we are going a little bit down with the numbers. So please not tens or hundreds, just really be reasonable. Thank you. I think we can confirm this from the commission side. So uh, dear participants, dear speakers, many thanks again for this uh, session, for the interesting questions. Uh, all the other questions will not be forgotten. We will of course download them from the Slido. As I said, all the material and the recording of this session will be available in a few moments in the website of this event. Thank you very much and have a nice rest of the day.